Um, thank you. Um, so again, uh, my name is Kelly Rourke from Pollinator Partnership. And um, I, sorry, I somehow missed uh, the introduction. So I'll just say briefly, um, I am uh, the director of programs here um, based out of San Francisco at our headquarters. And um, with me today will be Amber Barnes, um, our wildlife conservation ecologist out of uh, Cleveland. Some of you may have uh, met previously at SP meetings. Um, and today we're really excited to be here with you to um, tell you about uh, the buzz on pollinators and what you can do to get involved. Um, Pollinator Partnership, our organization, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We've been around for over 25 years, um, and our mission is to promote and protect all pollinators critical to food and ecosystems. So I know many of you are already familiarized with the importance of pollinators being that they provide one third out of every bite of foods we eat. So um, very, very important and vital to our everyday lives. So um, just want to briefly go over the agenda for today. We're going to talk about what is the status of pollinators. We're going to look at a case study. Oops, these are out of order. Uh, ways that Pollinator Partnership can approach the problem. We're going to look at a couple of case studies of our monarch butterfly work in the Midwest. And we're going to talk about some other signature initiatives, um, primarily Pollinator Week and some other programs that um, can help the suppliers partnership um, and the work that you all are doing. So what is the status of pollinators? So unfortunately, most if not all pollinators are in decline in North America. Um, bumblebees are in decline. One quarter of all bumblebee species in North America are threatened or near threatened category. Um, this is uh, a photo of the endangered rusty patch bumblebee that was uh, the first bee in the continental United States to be added to the endangered species list. Um, and there are a, a couple other pollinators up for um, uh, up for listing under the ESA and other um, state-based um, protection regulations. Um, you probably are aware that honeybees are also in trouble. Uh, managed honeybee colony losses have been increasing since about 2006 when colony collapse disorder um, first came to the scene. Also, monarch butterflies are also in decline. Um, so this graph shows over time from 1994, um, the overwintering grounds in Mexico where the monarch butterfly goes to migrate in the winter. So this is, um, these figures are the hectares of land that those monarchs are covering. So you can see overall there's a, a downward trend. Um, in 2018 to 19, so last winter we did have a pretty good year, um, but that primarily was due to uh, weather conditions and it still overall is, is very much uh, behind historical records. So how do we solve these problems? It really requires an all hands on deck approach. Large or small, we need it all. And that's our thing to habitat. So habitat islands and corridors are vital. And pollinators don't care about borders. So they don't abide by uh, state borders or even international borders. So it really requires um, a lot of collaboration and a lot of different partners working together um, from various stakeholder groups um, around the entire globe, really. And one thing that, that Pollinator Partnership really advocates for, an, a relatively easy, easy thing individuals, um, other NGOs or corporations can do is to increase habitat. So increase floral diversity, equals increased biodiversity, and that's going to help pollinators. So next, I want to talk a little bit about um, pollinator partnerships approach to the problem. So again, like I mentioned earlier in our mission, we, we protect all pollinators. We do this by um, conducting independent uh, research. We have various studies um, surrounding a, a wide range of pollinator topics from honeybee health um, to bumblebee research uh, to monarch butterfly uh, plant pollinator interactions. Um, lots of projects going on throughout North, North America in terms of research. 
we also really focus on creating habitat. So we do a lot of habitat restoration. Um, we also provide a lot of materials to help other people create habitat, to know how to um, select the right plants for their area, how to prep the ground, and how to maintain habitat so it's long lasting and really impactful for pollinators. We also promote good stewardship. So um, one example of this is um, promoting uh, various municipalities like departments of transportation to um, advocate for uh, best management practices when uh, managing roadsides for pollinators. We do this in a lot of different sectors, um, you know, with various corporations like some of, of you on the, on the webinar today, um, as well as at the federal state level, um, and even um, really local levels as well in cities and, and county uh, levels, just to really impart those best management practices for pollinators. Partnership is in our name. So one of the really, really um, important things that we do is we convene all parties. Um, so this is a photo of the Wildlife Habitat Council Board, um, which I know some of you work with and who we work with closely. Um, and it's a really good example of a strong partnership that we have and one that really does help to bring um, a lot of stakeholders to the table to discuss a wide range of issues and, and uh, brainstorm on how we, can, how we can help them. We also do some work um, on policy. Um, we have done a lot of work uh, surrounding roadside regulations uh, like the FAST Act and the B, uh, B Highways Act. And we also do a lot of work with the Environmental Protection Agency and EPA surrounding pesticide use. Um, this photo is really an example of uh, the importance of labeling of pesticides and how um, that can be, um, how the misuse of pesticides can be um, really detrimental to pollinators. So that's something we really focus on in the in the policy arena. And we do a lot of outreach. Um, so this is an example of a outreach event at a school. Um, we do outreach um, during pollinator week, which is coming up in two weeks and, um, and next week rather. And uh, I'll be talking about later today. Um, we also have lots of resources for download and printing and ordering and sharing on our website um, just to really spread the word at all, um, all levels of the communities and um, to educate as many people as we can about pollinators. And lastly, this is all to protect all pollinators. Um, so we're talking about the birds, the bats, the butterflies, the beetles, um, even some small mammals that all pollinate um, and help promote ecosystem health and human health as well. So pollinator partnership can help you with online resources that are available on pollinator.org. We can help with habitat design and installation, guidelines and manuals. Um, we have a lot of really great technical guides on our website as well, catered to different audiences. We can help with sustainability reports. Um, employee and customer programs has been a, a really fun thing that we get to do with various um, companies to engage their employees and families and community members as well. Um, also planting and seeding consultations. Um, that's one really important um, aspect of our consultation work that um, is really important to ensure that the right type of plant material and habitat is going onto the ground so that we can really have the, the biggest impact for pollinators we can. So I'm going to turn it over to Amber now to talk about our first case study. So take it away, Amber. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. Um, and hello, everyone. This is uh, as I said, Amber Barnes, um, Wildlife Conservation Ecologist with Pollinator Partnership. And I'm really fortunate enough to have been able to meet many of you in January at your Ohio meeting, as well as uh, provide assistance to the Biodiversity Working Group and some of their monarch projects. And I'm really thrilled to be with you guys today for this webinar. Um, and so uh, while you've already been introduced a bit to Project Wingspan through the Biodiversity Working Group, We'd like to tell you a little bit about how we got here, you know, what the project's all about, and how you can get involved with this large-scale initiative to really help reconnect the fragmented habitat for our imperiled pollinators. Um, so let's start off with how we got to Project Wingspan. 
Uh, it's widely known that monarchs and other pollinators are in need of quality habitat along their range in order to support their struggling populations. And to help address this uh, need for quality habitat and restored connectivity of the landscape, um, P2 has been working on numerous large and small scale efforts across North America. Um, and knowing uh, that large scale conservation was needed to address this issue, um, we started with a few projects. Um, and so uh, as you see on the screen, we've got um, this really all built on the success of a smaller scale uh, monarch wings across Ohio. Um, in which we worked with a variety of partners across multiple land use types to create and research monarch habitat throughout Northeast Ohio. And the success of that project led Pollinator Partnership to see if we could work with other groups to create monarch habitat on a larger scale. And so we sent a grant request off to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, and we received funding for a large scale eco-regional approach to creating monarch habitat involving partners throughout five states. Next slide. And so monarch wings across the eastern broadleaf forest kicked off in fall 2016. Our overarching goal was really to increase monarch habitat within the eastern broadleaf forest continental province. And we focused in um, five states, monarch, uh, um, Missouri, Arkansas, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. And um, we worked with multiple partners to establish an eco-regional collecting um, network, as well as a plant materials development network. We provided uh, technical assistance and training both to volunteers and public land managers. And all of this was really to um, establish long-term monarch habitat. Next slide, please. And with the help of this multitude of uh, project partners and an amazing and dedicated team of volunteers, uh, P2 was able to meet or exceed nearly all of our goals. And so um, over the next two slides, I'm just going to give you a really quick snapshot of what we were able to accomplish over that two and a half year ground period. So Pollinator Partnership, our state leads and other core partners developed a robust seed collection protocol to help volunteers learn to identify and collect seed from our target uh, native wildflowers. We held trainings across our project states and created um, a great community. Uh, and as a result, over two years, our amazing 327 volunteers were able to collect um, collections from um, 368. So each of those collections is of a, a species out in the field of seed. And that resulted in 100 pounds of clean seed. Some of that was grown out, and we were able to grow out 11,482 seedlings. Um, and the value of this volunteer um, collected seed and, and grown out materials ended up being almost $60,000. Um, next slide, please. And um, we also worked with project partners throughout this five state focus area to identify, secure, and enhance over 27,000 acres of monarch habitat throughout the region. Uh, we actually ended up exceeding our goal by over 23,000 acres. And um, using the seed and the seedling plants resulting from those volunteer collection efforts, we were able to enhance over 44 high quality monarch conservation projects throughout the region. Um, and that leads to Project Wingspan. Um, and you know, with monarch wings across the Eastern Broadleaf Forest wrapping up and these incredible achievements under our belt, we applied to the National Fish and Wildlife Fund for another two-year grant titled Project Wingspan. And this is to help us um, further develop rapid increases in available seed and plant materials, which are often the limiting factor for many conservation efforts. And this is to support not only the monarch, but also now the rusty patch bumblebee and other imperiled pollinators by increasing this habitat. Next slide, please. And so with this project, we're building upon the foundations laid by our previous efforts and expanding our reach to new project states, Michigan, including Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Um, and so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about our goals for Wingspan and how we plan to achieve them and how um, 
all of you and your uh, efforts can um, plug into this. So really, it's, it's real people, everyday people making a huge difference in a short amount of time. Um, we've developed a robust assortment of tools to support and train our volunteers along every step of this project. Next slide. And this includes detailed plant profiles to help them um, learn to identify and differentiate our 29 target species we're focusing on. And these have uh, pictures of the flowers, the leaves, the seeds, um, and more to learn the key characteristics of each of our focus plants in a really easy to digest manner. Next slide. Um, but we also want to make sure that as we're doing collections, we are not harming the landscape, we're not harming any of our collection site locations, and that everybody is doing um, these collections to the, the highest quality standards of um, science and, and seed collection. We've developed a standardized seed collection protocol that we're carrying out throughout the region to maintain consistency. And, and we're making sure to train all of our volunteers in proper plant identification and seed collection methods. It's a critical part of this project to ensure that our volunteers are confident in their abilities and have all the resources that they need in order to make successful, responsibly conducted seed collections. Um, and to this effort, we've generated several high quality webinars to assist volunteers and land managers alike to learn the skills to help with pollinator conservation um, through Project Wingspan. Next slide. And we're also engaging with volunteers through our online habitat survey, where anyone with one or more acres of habitat that's being managed for monarchs, rusty patch bumblebee, or other pollinators um, can fill it out. It's a really quick process. Easy. Um, anyone who wants to get their acreage counted is encouraged to fill it out. And um, the participants in the survey then qualify for a free on-site consultation with our monarch and pollinator habitat specialist coordinator um, and a chance to potentially receive seed or plugs from the program. Next slide, please. And we've also um, had developed some really innovative and uh, fantastic partnerships with other institutions such as uh, the University of Arkansas Center for Advanced Spatial Technologies. Um, we've been able to arm our volunteers with a, a really easy um, smartphone app so that they can enter data into the field, um, which also feeds into the University of Arkansas um, helping them with model validation and gives us a way to um, track these collections in real time. Next slide, please. So um, I'll go over our uh, main three goals now. Um, first, it's to grow up, um, our network from our eastern broadleaf forest states and then develop these networks within Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. We're working with existing collection programs to create this temporary coordinated regional seed collection and distribution network. And uh, the, one of the best parts about this program is the skills that our volunteers learn can then be applied to their local co um, conservation efforts and support uh, the local conservation capacity in future work. And um, all of this is really needed because Regionally specific milkweed and other forest plant seed is generally commercially unavailable in large quantities throughout much of the country. And even when it is available, it can be prohibitively expensive for some projects. And so our dedicated team of volunteers are collecting this high quality regionally adapted seed from the landscape, which will then be used to enhance pollinator habitat throughout the Midwest and Great Lakes region. Our second goal is to provide technical assistance and training for not only these seed collection efforts, but also um, habitat enhancement and creation. We'll soon be launching an online training if you'd like to get involved that way. And um, we're also hosting um, in-person uh, trainings one in each of our states, and you can find those um, dates and everything on our website. Uh, but we'll also be promoting and disseminating our seven-part webinar series to empower more land stewards with the knowledge of how they 
can prepare, create, and maintain their own habitat for imperiled pollinators. And um, these resources can be really useful to all of you in um, planning and planting for your sustainability projects. And uh, finally, our third goal is to secure 10,000 acres of long-term habitat through partnership with public and private landowners. And we're working with landowners and managers that are committed to Monarch, Rusty Patch, and other imperiled pollinator conservation um, through this long-term management and maintenance of habitat. Next slide. And our collection goals, we're aiming to collect at least a thousand seed collections across our six state region, um, which ends up being about 167 collections per state over two years. And we're seeking to target common native species that are either monarch larval hosts, high quality pollen and nectar resources for the rusty patch bumblebee, monarch and other imperiled species, um, and other host plants to support our other Lepidoptera. Species. Next slide, please. And um, there's lots of ways that those in the Supplier's Partnership for the Environment can get involved if you're interested. Um, as an individual or an organization, um, there's many ways to plug in. And as I said, the skills and partnerships that are formed through your involvement can help strengthen not only your sustainability projects, but tell a great story to others about how you're assisting with this innovative approach to creating large scale change to reconnect and enhance the landscape, um, not only for the uh, endangered rusty patch and the imperiled monarch, but really all the wildlife utilizing these much needed resources. Um, so if you're interested in becoming trained, um, we uh, let us know. If you're interested in, in leading a collection team or have a seed collection site, uh, we've got an online form that you can enter and, and let us know. Um, or just providing support and connection to our state coordinators. If you know of people who might be interested, you know, please let us know. Um, and then aside from that, just enhancing land for monarchs and the rusty patch bumblebee uh, is, is so key um, to these, this conservation effort. Um, so feel free to um, submit some of your pollinator projects um, over an acre into our survey and um, help us to get those acres counted. And uh, feel free to share about our project and our volunteer needs. And um, there's always uh, potential opportunities to also provide um, sponsorship for the project. And then next slide. And really all of this is to create a rapid increase of much needed habitat um, and you know, as you can see from the Eastern Broadleaf Forest Project, we were able to do a lot in a little bit of time, um, and we're aiming to do even more this round. Um, and we'd be thrilled to work with um, any of you to hit those goals. Um, and additionally, uh, you know, many of you are um, focused in the kind of the Midwest, South southeast and other regions. Um, but we also, the monarch population in um, the western side of the United States uh, is definitely facing um, just as many challenges or more than our eastern population. And so Pollinator Partnership is leading the way with monarch wings across California. Uh, we're just getting started there. We've got three long-term butterfly habitat and research projects plots. Um, we've been working with over 50 individuals, um, volunteers, and um, sites uh, to um, plant these demonstrations um, and activities. And so far, we've already planted over 1,500 native nectar and milkweed plants. Um, and we're just looking to continue to um, grow and expand that effort as well. And then, um, Kelly, I think I'm turning it back over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Amber. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to take the rest of the time to share with you some other um, programs, pollinator partnership programs that can help you um, in the suppliers partnership. So in addition to Project Wingspan, which Amber just um, gave a great overview of, which is 
taking place in Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. And then um, the addition of Monarch Wings across California taking place um, out here in the West. We've got um, some other great initiatives that you may be interested in um, learning about and or joining. So probably one of our, our most popular and, um, and one that I'm really proud of, one of our initiatives is uh, National Pollinator Week. It really started at the national level, but now has even uh, taken flight to really get on a global scale, which is great. So. So this is a week, um, basically just a celebration of pollinators, um, their beauty, their cultural significance, and the actual, um, you know, everyday things that they provide. Um, you know, whether it's pollination to promote biodiversity on the landscapes or pollination of, of crops um, and, you know, providing those great foods that we love like chocolate and coffee and berries. Um, providing all of that to um, to us on a on a daily basis. So Pollinator Week this year is taking place June 17th through the 23rd, and um, you can find all of this information and more at pollinator.org. So um, each year we have um, some annual events. Uh, we at Pollinator Partnership coordinate some events at the national level. Um, we work with USDA on a pollinator festival. We do a congressional briefing each year. There's actually a Pollinator Protection Caucus in Congress. Um, and we also have um, some pollinated receptions to help uh, bring stakeholders together um, and uh, just celebrate the great um, work that pollinators do on our behalf. Um, so there's also a lot of events that take place at the local level. So we encourage you to um, engage your colleagues, customers, families, community members to show your commitment to sustainability during pollinator week. Um, people do this through a lot of different ways. You can host a planting day, um, host a, a expert lecture or a, or a beekeeping class. Um, there are actually uh, the middle bottom picture here is a picture of the Empire State Building lit up like a bee. Um, so there's landmarks throughout uh, the nation and, and actually North America that are lighting up for pollinator week. Um, and then education and outreach, just helping to inspire others to learn about pollinators or do something to help them. Really, anyone can participate at any level in Pollinator Week. Um, so we work with corporations, federal and state agencies, city governments, wineries and farmers, museums and zoos, schools and universities, other NGOs, and individuals. We also, uh, for the past four years, have been able to secure proclamations from all 50 governors of every state. Um, and they basically sign a proclamation um, in support of Pollinator Week at the state level. Um, so this is a really uh, big task that Pollinator Partnership um, helps coordinate, but something that just shows the um, you know, bipartisan support and um, just the the far reaching geographic support um, that um, all the states have for for pollinators and pollinator week. Um, the map here shows um, the a map that's hosted on our website at pollinator.org where you can actually register uh, local events and they'll be placed on the map and you can click on each dot and read more about um, each event that's taking place, maybe in a state or a city near you. Um, we have about over 200 events uh, registered so far, and I think last year we had uh, about 250, so hoping um, that'll continue to grow over the next few days as well. So I encourage you to celebrate Pollinator Week, again, June 17th through the 23rd. Um, some ideas, uh, you can start really at any level, um, something really simple, um, or if you wanna do something a little bit more involved, Start planning now for next year. Sometimes I know um, these types of coordinated efforts can take a little bit of time, so it's never too uh, too early to start planning for the future as well. So think about um, beginning your own or joining a social media campaign. That's something that you can pull together pretty quickly, or even um, if you're joining a campaign and just maybe even resharing or retweeting some of Pollinator Partnerships social media activity, you can show um, you know your support for the for the 
celebration of pollinators. <clears throat> um, you can highlight Pollinator Week in your newsletter um, or some other type of corporate outreach. Um, you can sponsor Pollinator Week. We solicit sponsorships for um, Pollinator Week each year. Um, so if you don't make it this year, next year is also an option. Um, a fun way to celebrate pollinators is by hosting a pollinator themed meal. So as I mentioned, you know, there's so many great uh, fruits, vegetables and nuts um, that pollinators provide that we would not have without pollinators. So um, it can be a fun way to um, host, a, host a meal and, you know, point out the different ingredients that are provided by pollinators. Um, employee planting days are always great. If you do have capacity on your landscape at one of your corporate facilities, you can think about um, doing a planting. Um, and then that's something that your employees and visitors can enjoy uh, for years to come. Um, also supporting native pollinators. So we have um, about 4,000 species of native bees um, in the United States. And um, a lot of them are not in colonies like honeybees, um, a lot of them are solitary and need a uh, different type of nesting habitat. So there's, it's actually really easy to pull together these um, little native bee structures. We have um, how to's and tutorials on our website, and that can be a fun activity you can do uh, with families and community members as well. So that's Pollinator Week. I wanna just briefly touch on some other programs that we that Pollinator Partnership can help you accomplish your sustainability goals. So first is the Be Smart School Garden Kit. So this is a really great program that Pollinator Partnership launched in 2010. Um, its purpose is to expose students to new ideas about food, wildlife, and plants. So it increases students' understanding in science, math, and language arts. And um, there's a lot of, it comes with a, uh, either a printed binder curriculum or a digital curriculum, and then various activities that teachers can uh, do with their classrooms to teach people, teach the students about pollinators, pollination, and how it connects to their daily lives. Um, so you can identify a committed school and purchase a school garden kit for them. And these are available for purchase and order on our website. One of our um, most cherished resources are our eco-regional planting guides. Um, these are widely applicable to many sustainability efforts and, and plantings. Um, so this is a, re a free online resource for regionally appropriate plant lists. We have 59 guides covering eco-regions throughout the United States and Canada. These guides um, teach you keys to developing great pollinator habitat, they give recommendations for locally native pollinator plants that you can incorporate into your habitat. Um, so these are available for download on our website at pollinator.org. You even can actually put in your zip code or postal code and um, it will direct you to the particular guide for your area. And then you just click to download it. So definitely encourage people to check that out if you're looking at doing something on your landscape for pollinators. So another um, fun and relatively new uh, project that Pollinator Partnership has launched is our um, Insight Citizen Science app. So this app is, um, it teaches people how to do observations and submit data for pollinator monitoring. So um, as you can see on the screenshots on the, on the screen, um, it teaches you about um, features and key characteristics of, of certain pollinator groups, and then also geolocates the, your location. It even takes note of the weather, and you can tally up which pollinators you're seeing on a particular plant. Um, you can even take a photo of the plant, and it uploads all that information. So uh, you can join this app as an organization or as a corporation um, that, so that we can isolate some biodiversity metrics for you. Um, it's great for basic monitoring of your pollinator projects. I know some of you in the biodiversity working group have some uh, projects that might be science or research based. So this would be a great way for you to feed into large scale citizen science efforts. So another program is the Mitathon. Um, so you can sponsor or just participate in the Mitathon. Um, I know I've heard from Amber that some of uh, the groups on 
on the um, on the line today um, actually do manage your own um, honeybee colonies, which is fantastic. So um, this this mitathon is a week in September each year. This week it's or this year it's going to be the seventh through the fourteenth of September, and it's all about just educating beekeepers about how to test and monitor for varroa mite. Um, you can test either individually or through beekeeping organizations. And all of the data is, is uploaded to um, mitecheck.com. So this is a partnership effort. Um, you can see the logos down at the bottom of the screen. This is just the core group. There's many, many other groups involved. And it's all about just raising awareness for the varroa mite, um, which is a, a, one of the most detrimental um, um, impacts on honeybees right now. And um, just teaching people about the importance of monitoring for this. Um, for this past. Another um, program that may be of interest to you if you're managing, um, if you're a land manager or have uh, colleagues that are, um, we have Protecting Pollinators, a pesticide application training module. So this is available again on pollinator.org. Um, it, it aims to increase your skill in minimizing the effects of pesticide applications on pollinators. It talks about the importance and current status of pollinators, how professional applicators can help protect pollinators, how to select and apply pesticides, and the importance of labels and label language. So this is a module um, available for order on our website. It comes with a workbook, a thumb drive, which has the PowerPoint, um, and a video as well, a, a 20 minute video on um, how to um, practice best management practices when um, applying pesticides, if and when you need to do it. So another great initiative that I think some um, folks in the Suppliers Partnership may be aware of is the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, or NAPSI for short. Um, so we would encourage you to join and attend or sponsor and support NAPSI. Um, each year, we have three major initiatives that are um, head, headed up by NAPSI. We have our annual poster each year, which this year's was Endangered Pollinators and Their Habitats. Um, we do this each spring, and we invite uh, corporations or partners, really um, anyone that, that wants to be represented on um, the poster uh, with their logo through um, sponsorship. We do a different theme each year. Um, and um, it, it's distributed over 200,000 of these posters annually. Um, another initiative of NAPSI is Pollinator Week, which I already covered. Um, the third is an annual conference that takes place in DC each October. And attendance at this conference uh, provides direct contact to over 170 NAPSI partners for relationship building. And this is, as you can tell by the diversity of the logos, hopefully you can see it there. Um, this is a, a group of um, NGOs, government agencies, uh, other corporations, um, uh, university researchers, really anyone that wants to come to the table to talk and brainstorm about uh, pollinator issues and what we can do collectively in partnership to help them. So it's a great way to showcase your sustainability efforts uh, through partnerships um, through NAPSI. Another great opportunity that we provide is a pollinator stewardship certification. Um, so this is whereby land managers get certified as a pollinator steward. So this is an individual um, professional development um, recognition. Um, it provides a science-based understanding of pollinators and the practical know-how of how to help them. It provides the knowledge to create habitat and then to impart education on others. Um, it's an important credential and one that people have um, will be really proud to share this credential. Um, the upper right-hand logo there is the uh, logo or seal of the certification that you will have access to um, using and it's something that can be added to a resume um, 
just a great recognition for those types of land managers that want to learn more about how what you do on a day-to-day -day can impact pollinators and how what you do on a day-to-day -day can help pollinators. So just kind of in summary, just want to point out that pollinator partnership can help you accomplish your sustainability goals. Um, we do provide individual consultations on habitat development, community engagement, employee participation, and strategic sustainability. So we hope and we invite you to talk to us about your questions and ideas concerning anything we talked about today or anything else concerning pollinators. Um, I, I believe, uh, Kellen, we have some time to do that. If we don't get to something today and you'd like to connect with us um, individually, um, our email addresses and phone number are here. And also all of these materials and programs are all represented on pollinator.org. So um, we hope you will um, check all of that out and, and follow up with us if, you, if you'd like to hear more. So just want to thank you all again for listening and, and joining the webinar today. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly and Amber, for, for that presentation. You've covered um, a lot of helpful resources and materials, so really, really appreciate it. Um, as Kelly said, we, we do have some time here for, for questions. If anybody has them, just you know, please remember to unmute your phone or you can uh, type in the chat box as well. Um, and while you think of those questions, I guess you know, I just want to remind everybody um, on the phone today that so far as far as shift to the biodiversity working group had um, you know, asked our members to make a uh, commitment where, where they could um, to engage in projects to support pollinators. Um, and I think you know, through the presentation today, um, you know, Kelly and Amber have really shown that, you know, there's a, there's a really a wide range of ways that the company or individual can do that, whether that's a habitat project, a seed collection, um, you know, providing data to support citizen science, um, you know, education and outreach in the community. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of great opportunities here for, for SP members to consider, you know, what, what approach may be right for, for them and, and their company. Um, so, you know, would encourage folks to follow up with with Amber and Kelly on, on any projects that are interested. Um, and please do let us know. Um, we, we'd love to hear that in terms of the biodiversity working group and that that commitment we're looking for this year. Um, so with that, any I'll open up any questions um, from the group for, for Kelly or Amber. Okay, well, you know, not not hearing any, um, and, and please do, you know, be sure to unmute your phone if you had a question. Uh, Kelly and Amber, maybe if I can just ask one before I let you go. Um, you spoke about, you know, the Project Wingspan and, you know, some of the opportunities for SP members to consider, you know, getting involved, whether that be through a habitat commitment or per, perhaps providing a site for a seed collection. Could you just share a little bit more detail about sort of what criteria you would be looking for or any, any requirements um, if a member wanted to consider making that commitment, either, you know, uh, provide their habitat for maintenance or perhaps provide a site as a seed collection location? Absolutely. Thanks, Callum. Um, that's a fantastic question. So um, if someone wanted to uh, contribute their, their habitat and and get that counted into our survey so we have a better understanding of what all habitat is out there, as well as that qualifies them to, you know, get um, for a chance to get their site visited for an on-site consultation or things like that. Um, they just need to go to our website and um, go to pollinator.org backslash wingspan, and there's a habitat survey where they can just enter in, um, I think it's like maybe a, a five minute survey or something that just enters in some of the um, characteristics of their site so that we can get a, a good idea of um, what all's there. 
And that helps us get a better idea of what all land um, habitat is out on the landscape. Um, and so, yeah, as long as it is a um, area that has um, some sort of pollinator um, habitat, whether that is, you know, a, a field with some native wildflowers that just doesn't get um, mowed regularly, and so it provides that nice um, year-round forage, or um, whether it's a, a side of a, um, as long as it's pretty much um, public or private land, as long as it's up to an acre, um, that can be entered into the, the survey. Um, and then in terms of the seed collection, um, for essentially, if anybody on the um, wants to participate as a seed collection site, we have a list of 29 target species that can be um, shared. We'll be getting it on our website soon, but it's not quite there yet. Um, but the, these 29 species are what our volunteers are focusing on um, collecting. And any site that has um, preferably, you know, more than 50 individual plants with those um, of those species would be con could be considered a area for a seed collection. Um, and a site doesn't have to have like all 29 of our species because that would be almost unprecedented. Uh, but if it was just a field that had some swamp milkweed, for instance, and, and you know, there's numerous plants there uh, that go to seed naturally um, that could be collected and then contribute to our initiative would be fantastic. And we do have a, a form that if anyone's interested in being a seed collection location, they can fill that out, let us know what species are there. Um, and then we'll send that along to our state coordinator and then they'll get in touch and, and see if that um, is anywhere near a, a collection team or, or if that can logistically work. Um, and an important thing to note um, for, for all aspects of the project is that these, we are forming seed collection teams um, that are led by someone with um, botanical skill, but we also require um, permits so no one Visits will always be scheduled ahead of time. Um, there will be permits to allow them onto a property. All of our volunteers need to sign a volunteer waiver, um, making sure that the no one um, that is the site uh, runs the site uh, can be held liable. Um, you know, if someone tripped and on a gopher hole or something and twisted their ankle. Um, so there's there's multiple protections um, for our collection sites, um, as well as our volunteers to um, make sure that everything's done to the highest standards. Great, thanks, Amber. Mm -hmm. uh, one question here that, that came into the chat, uh, has Pollinator Partnership done any projects on landfills? On landfills? Yeah. Yeah, we have actually. Um, so we have worked on landfills as well as some other remediation sites. Um, we um, in Georgia worked on the um, Armstrong, an Armstrong site um, in Macon, Georgia, um, after it was uh, decommissioned, filled in, and then we worked on the um, rehabilitation and, and restoration um, after that. Um, we've also done work on, um, we, we work with uh, the Boeing company quite a bit. And um, we've done a couple of um, uh, remediation projects with them, whereby we transfer, um, there was an old rocket launching site, um, an old um, uh, jet testing facility base, um, where we have um, worked with them to create either garden networks or um, actually do research projects um, if it's a unique landscape. Um, and really just work with the company to, you know, based on their sustainability goals and their research goals um, to transition those landscapes into something, um, you know, that can be really useful and, and easily managed for pollinator habitat. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, another question that I think is, ties into that one a little bit. Um, someone is saying they have land owned by the city uh, that would be great for a reclamation project and, and mm. planting native species there. 
Um, would you have any recommendations on you know the approach in terms of taking a proposal for that kind of project to the to the landowner? Yeah, definitely. Um, I would I would encourage um, you to to reach out to us individually. Actually, we have. Um, We've worked with a lot of um, cities at the local level, um, and they all um, they all work a little bit differently, I would say. So depending on where you're located, um, we can um, help and see if we have any local resources there for you. Um, but I think definitely checking out those eco-regional planting guides that I mentioned, putting in the zip code for the city, and you'll be able to get, um, it's they're about a 30-page guide that will tell you all about the local pollinators, the local climate and um, topography, soil, all of those types of things about your particular landscape. And then it will give you planting lists where you can actually narrow them down depending on what you are trying to attract and what you want your landscape to look like. So for example, you can find a red plant that attracts hummingbirds. And it's, it's really easy to um, meet the needs of the landowner and um, be able to provide really detailed recommendations for them um, at that level. Okay, great. And then you know, one more question that's come in. Um, what grades or age groups are the Be Smart um, Garden Kids intended for? So they're intended for grades three through six. So it's it's about elementary to middle school. We have found them a little bit more widely applicable than that. I've even had um, you know some eighth grade um, uh, classrooms use them as well. Um, so three through six was the initial intention, but um, it can go up or down a little bit there. Okay, great. Um, and okay, we've got one more question here. So if private lands are being used for multiple acres of habitat. Um, are there any, I think that says agriculture exemption in incentives that a um, someone may be able to apply for? Hmm. Good question. Um, I think it, it depends on the agriculture that's nearby and adjacent to the lands. Um, I know just the, the kind of quickest example that came to my mind is we're working a lot with solar companies. Um, and I know that through their um, permitting process to get solar, solar um, projects established, um, the co-location of honeybees, as well as the implementation of pollinator habitat helps satisfy the agricultural requirement for their permitting. Um, so there's clear and, and very definitive evidence that pollinator habitat adjacent to ag lands improves and benefits the agricultural landscape. So I think there's definitely a case um, to be made depending on, you know, what exactly you're you're trying to do and what, what exactly the private land is and what exactly the um, adjacent ag lands are. But um, I hope that helps. I, if I knew a little bit more about it, I'm sure we could help more. So feel free and, and email me if you'd like as well. Excellent. Well, um, thank you so much, Kelly and Amber, again, for the, for the presentation. Um, for the Supplies Partnership members, we will be making a copy of this presentation available. Um, likely, uh, you'll see that in your inbox tomorrow morning. But uh, please do uh, reach out to Kelly or Amber if you have any you know, questions or additional follow-up here. Um, and you know, thank you again so much for, for taking the time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.